Buckle in for the next half hour as we take a trip from the prehistoric times to a galaxy far, far away. And if that isn't already random enough, we'll also be plunging you into both a raucous game of arrow tag and a soothing bath. It's all right here on, on The, the journal. I'm Farin Karim, and for today's installment of the journal, we have an exciting bunch of documentaries that focus on the eclectic passions of people in our city of Toronto. Our subjects are all collectors in their own way, with some of them acquiring rare items for private and public collections, while others are collecting unique experiences. To introduce the first of these documentaries, let's throw it to my co-host, Cheyenne, over in the control room. Thanks, girl. Our first doc centers around Glenn Cruz, a hacker instructor who's been quietly amassing a treasure trove of Star Wars collectibles and other memorabilia since before many young fans of the series were born. Filmmaker German Leyes visited Glenn at his home in North York to explore just how extensive his collection is. Let's take a look for ourselves. Here is Cruising the Toy Shelf. My full name is Glenn Philip Aristain Cruz. I am a teacher of uh, Maori culture in the Maori Haka, and I teach a lot in uh, Montreal. I purchase toys maybe once a week, sometimes um, once every two weeks. I used to really go into it a lot, but um, now I really only uh, purchase what, what I want. The two big ones, Star Wars and G.I. Joe for me. Lego is everything else. <laughs> what got me into collecting was uh, because I loved the movie so much. Uh, there's a part of the movie that you want to have for yourself. I have obsessed over certain items before in the past, but now I've learned to just let go. I, I find it somewhere else, and a lot of times that I don't look for it is when I find it. This is the Star Wars Cantina Bar, so we've got all sorts of Star Wars items there, things that are uh, retro from uh, the 70s and 80s and 90s, and uh, if I could guess how much I have spent, um, oh my god, I'd have to say definitely 10, 20, maybe, maybe close to $30,000 altogether for, for, for everything that I've ever purchased for myself. These were the Hasbro 12 inches. They're really nice. Um, they were okay at the time. Um, the sculpt is uh, very much like uh, Tim Wera Morrison because it was uh, a real scanned on him. So that's like a dead on. I've had negative feedback a few times in different kinds of ways. Some people, they look at it as um, they would say and use the term lightly um, in the geek kind of way or nerd kind of way. Whereas um, collecting things of fandom is nowhere do I see it uh, being a nerd or a geek. But when you think about it, um, it's just pop culture and everybody likes something. I could also uh, uh, say that there have been a couple of times where people have said, oh, you're grown and you buy that, uh, which is funny, but it makes me happy. I'm not buying it for them. It makes me happy. And it's not, I'm not hurting anybody doing it. Action figures, action figure, action figures. When I was younger, when I would be a completist and just blow entire paychecks on looking for every single figure and buying cases of all the whole shebang um, those are times where I'd get more eyes from my mom where she would get really annoyed with me saying why are you buying all this stuff for 
you know, there's no reason for you. And when I think about it now, she was right. <laughs> what I was planning to do with my collection, um, you know, getting older and, uh, and eventually when I pass, um, <clears throat> a lot of it would be given to my kids, other family members. My brother, and if my brother has kids, um, Stephanie's sister, if Stephanie's sister has kids, and she's not a toy collector, but um, eventually. And then also um, to certain friends, there'd be certain items that I'd be giving to certain friends um, or fr friends' kids' families. So that's probably what I would do. Well, let me just show you one last thing. This is what Stephanie collects. This is amazing. Oh, wow. So many amazing things in that one house. Cheyenne, are you a big Star Wars fan? No. Oh, Cheyenne. There are so many great characters in this universe, from Neil Gunray to Watto and Bosnas, not to mention everyone's favorite Gungan, Jar Jar Binks. And who could forget preteen Anakin and its young Boba Fett? It's just so cool to see them when they were kids. Ugh, episodes one and two, the best. <laughs> I just, I can't with this whole conversation. So I think it's time to move on. Our next stock focuses on actor Ken Ferguson and his month long project where he was invited to bathe in a different person's tub for every day in the month of January. Darth Vader had a bath in Rogue One, just saying. Here's Alex Evans' documentary, The Adventures of Ken Ferguson. <laughs> I'm Ken Ferguson and I grew up in a small town of 300 people uh, close to Stratford, Ontario. And I have gotten a couple of different degrees, uh, neither of which I'm using. <laughs> I always liked performing. I was a competitive trampolinist and I did drama in high school, but I never went into it until I had worked a couple of corporate jobs um, that I didn't feel like really suited me. So when I was 30, I decided I was going to try to be an actor. With the Bathtubs of Buns project, I was going to do one bath a day for the 31 days and that was it. But it's grown into something way more than what I thought it was going to. I was and still am a very active member of Buns, which is a trading group that was started on Facebook and has turned into an app. And it's where you trade things. And I got very um, involved in that community and I met a lot of really cool people. And I trade a lot of strange things and had a lot of adventures from that. And one day I was at a woman who's now a friend of mine, Anna's place, and she was leading me through her apartment and I saw a bathtub and I was like, holy shit, I haven't had a bath for so long. <laughs> I'm jealous. And she had this moment where she said, well, if you want to have a bath, you could come here and do that. And I was like, yeah, I could trade for baths. It was kind of a, a New Year's resolution for myself to do this idea that I had a year ago and I didn't expect it to go where it has. Should we get the bath going? I never really thought of, of laughter or, or comedy as a therapy, but it is. I think everybody needs a laugh every once in a while, because life can get really hard. And so I guess this project has also kind of changed my mind around that idea of what therapy is too, because you know I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist or anything. I don't profess to be 
but I go in with an open mind and I'll, I'll hear about, you know, someone's drug addictions or, or suspicions of drug addictions and I'll, I'll go in and I'll hold someone's hand if they're talking about a, a tough situation that they've been through. You know, I, I didn't really expect anything like this. And I'm, I'm happy that I'm, I'm affecting people and helping people. I never went in with the intention of being therapeutic, but I guess, you know, an actor's job is to try to relate to people and to try to connect and to try to convey emotion. And I think a lot of the time with actors and movies or plays, it, it gives an outlet for people to express emotion that, you know, they're given an, a passage to, to do that. And that's that venue. So I think as an actor, I want to try to, to help people with, with dealing with their emotions or expressing their emotions. The role of social media versus traditional media has been an interesting point because people have brought that up that, you know, it's newspapers and television and I got interviewed by a magazine as well by Dandy Horse magazine which is a cycling magazine Toronto Star interview was uh, fairly early on because radio I, I was interviewed by three radio stations too one in Fargo North Dakota one in Dublin Ireland and one here in Toronto Kiss 92.5 I also got covered by places that didn't even contact me like you know, when, when Vice contacted me or when The Star contacted me or when BuzzFeed contacted me, they did really thorough interviews and they, they asked me a lot of questions. Getting messages from people around the world saying like, you made me laugh, thank you, I was having a bad day. And like hosts that I've had, they're like, thank you, I needed to, to talk about that. Or, you know, I've been having a really rough go of life lately and I had affected their days and that's what I wanted to do. Like the whole reason was just to make some people laugh and give people a break from some of the negativity in this world. Just having something silly or fun like that to kind of take my mind off of things. So because of that global connection now, I want to take it to different countries because I've gotten invitations to go to different people's cities and their bathtubs in 20 plus countries. And it was so gratifying to have that. So now I hope I can do that globally and, and show people, you know, different connections that we all have as, as, as people. Wow, what a fun and unique story and a wild variety of bats. Cheyenne, have you ever had any weird bats like that? Irene, no. Me neither. But after seeing all of those Cheerios, I'm oddly hungry. Honey nut Cheerios or regular? Ugh, who eats regular? It's better for you. Well, while you're trying to eat healthy, I might just get active by heading on over to the setting of our next mini doc, Archer's Arena. Producer Zach Trevor takes us to the best arrow battle battlefield to see it all happen. Wait, did he actually film people shooting real arrows at each other? Let's take a look. <laughs> I shot archery my first time in high school. Afterwards, I discovered this, this whole activity. Hey. This was just a bare warehouse. So we built this, like, like our, our owners and our staff, we built this from scratch, like just bare bone. Uh, every week, every two weeks, some of our staff don't come in for two weeks. They're like, wait, this is new? This is new? This, and this is a repetitive, ongoing thing for every two weeks. I love coming down here to practice. My friend actually worked here. She said that she can help me and my club have a like an outing here as a social event. And I thought that was a good idea, so we exchanged numbers. And um, yeah, from there it's been history. First thing is when you walk in, you see the sniper tower. So everybody's like, I want to be the sniper. That was one of our key differentiating points. Then all our competitions started opening up their own sniper towers. Majority of our business now is all word of mouth 
uh, people have been here second time, third time, fourth time. They bring their friends, they have such a good time, they bring friends again. I don't think anything's a hard job so long as you're willing to do it. I absolutely love it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, meeting new people is always nice. Showing them the ropes around archery is it's a lot of fun too, so I really enjoy that. There's um, a term called Kaizen. Uh, it's from Toyota. Basically, it's continuous improvement. It's a philosophy, and that's something that all our staff embody uh, as well. So we apply that here. Understood? You are never safe with them. If you manage to get a hold of this, you are allowed to throw it. Not only the paladins are allowed to do this, right? <laughs> Not just a game anymore. <laughs> Archer's arena looks so dope. I can't wait to go myself. Now, Cheyenne, I feel like I keep shooting you keep shooting me down when I ask you these questions <laughs> after these docs, but I don't know. Have you ever dreamed of battling someone with just a bow and arrow? Yes. Oh. <laughs> cool. Well, arrows have been used as a tool and weapon for something like sixty thousand years. So maybe there's some primal instinct to want to use them in all of us, even if it is with giant foam-tipped arrows. No. No foam. Well, <laughs> speaking of things from thousands and even millions of years ago, our final doc today brought together our producers of our previous three pieces to pay a visit to an amazing free national history center in our city. German Alex and Zach take us to Prehistoria and Skull Store for our final documentary, Prehistoria. Enjoy! Yeah, my name is Ben Levitt. I'm the head curator of the Prehistoria Natural History Center, and I run the biggest oddity shop in Canada, Skull Store. The main objective of our work is to break down the barriers between modern society and the natural world. If you think about it, your entire exposure to natural history is behind a pane of glass. You don't really have a tangible connection to the natural world if you live in a major city. So we can break down those barriers by dropping a dinosaur in the hands of a child, or letting kids pet a piece of fur from a grizzly bear we got from the Inuit. It makes history more real and more relatable, which is something that we feel is, is critical to getting the new generation into being environmentally conscious and helping us forward our conservation goals overall. Prehistoria is a vision my brother Jake and I had of creating a free education center. Um, something that's accessible to everybody. It encompasses everything from taxidermy, like my friend here, to fossils and dinosaurs. A place that even if you can't afford, you could still come in and get a hands-on experience with the world around you. For us, we believe that an animal should not go through undue pain or anything like that. Even when I was a kid, I used to preserve roadkill. I used to um, like do ceremonial things. I was a like, fire keeper and different things. So I've always been around animals, and there was like there's spirit animals in, in the natives' like teachings and stuff like that. So I've always been into animals. And then when we realized that animals were being wasted after they died, we realized we could save them and find a market for them. And also we realized we could open a museum and show the world all the animals that, that have passed away or people could learn from them and everything. But when it comes to sustainably sourcing and ethically sourcing stuff, like we, we don't want hunting trophies. We don't want stuff that's being killed to be on a shelf. Uh, I would say probably about 90% of our material comes from zoos, vets, farms, and Aboriginal peoples. 
So it's, it's a harm reduction strategy where we can sweep up the garbage of human interactions with the natural world and find a way to make it something that we can respect and learn from. Here is a conjoined twin. Two heads are better than one. In this case, I guess two faces are better than one. Uh, and one in every 100,000 animals, on average, is born with polycephaly, where a conjoined fetus will exhibit extra limbs, extra heads, and other usually fatal, fatal features. And for us, we'd rather find them and preserve them. Um, not only is it a, a sideshow attraction, it also opens up people's minds to the potentials of genetics, and even the field of genetics to start with. It's hard to really get like a free or affordable interaction with the natural world. Um, there's no faulting the Toronto Zoo and the Ron for charging what they charge. They have a lot of bills to pay and you gotta make the money somewhere. Um, but we feel there should also be an accessible option. Uh, in the neighborhood we're in now, it's a very much so a struggling neighborhood. It has a, a relatively, for Canada, low literacy level. We have so many families that come in and they're like, wait, dinosaurs are real? We hear that surprisingly often. We hear that at least a couple times a month. And we're like, yeah, you want proof dinosaurs are real? Here's a piece of one. Here's the egg of one. Here's the skull of one. It, it creates a context that if you can't afford the ROM or you never went to school, maybe you're missing in your life. And if you don't have that, it's hard to pass it on to your children. I'll take like an animal that's died in a zoo or that someone's brought me like that's been not killed to be on to be a specimen but has died of natural causes or whatever and I'll clean either the skull I'll clean down to the skeleton I have a polar bear skull now I have a grizzly bear skull I have all kinds of uh, wolf skulls um, I have different types of wolf skulls so you can compare them together to see the different anatomy so it's always into like more of like carnivores and stuff like that well with my background I never thought I'd be on the path I am today I actually developed a lot of health conditions when I was in high school and it prevented me from continuing my education and obtaining a degree. My, my field of study was going to be environmental sciences. That wasn't what fate handed me. So I ended up getting into the, the animal trade, the live animal trade, and I realized a lot of people's pets are pulled out of the wild. You know, from Egypt before the, the Arab Spring, you could buy a leopard gecko plucked out of the desert for 50 cents. I found this to be a barbaric practice. So I set up a co-op across the country of breeders of exotic animals, and we isolated what species are most exploited and propagated them in captivity and opened up a rescue for animals that shouldn't be in people's homes or needed to be in better ones. If you outright ban everything, then the only market is the black market. And sometimes you need to create an avenue to, to divert the, the flow of illicit activity. Um, so we don't just say, hey, come buy a tiger. Hey, come buy a, a lion cub. We say, this is available. This is the context of it's from a zoo. You're supporting these facilities. And this is why we'd rather you buy one that's born in captivity if you are going to buy one. And if you don't want to buy one, that's great too. There's less demand for the entire world. And when it comes to the future of, of what we're doing, we, we're very careful not to set too much in stone. The, the flexibility of our business plan and our ability to go with the flow, our diversity of product ranges has really been our, our saving grace. Some markets will come, some markets will go, but if you diversify, like in the natural world, if you're adaptive, you'll survive and you'll grow and you'll thrive. Um, so for us, we'll have a year where almost no one wants to buy a skull, but that's okay. I have fossils. You don't feel like buying fossils? Okay, I have ancient Egyptian carvings. So in terms of where we're growing, we're going to move closer to the subway line. That's more of an imminent goal in the next few months. But we want to have a big retail and education center in Toronto. But in the outskirts of Toronto... It would honestly be to open a full-size museum and zoo, like to have live animals next to like their, their skeletons, next to what they evolved from, basically. So that's basically it, to have a, have a full museum that we can have free to the public without people having to pay for it, where you can actually touch a specimen. You can pick it up, you can look at it, you could buy it if you want. That's basically the goal with this place. And now back from the wild to the comfort of our studio where we have a talented musician and Centennial alumnus here to perform his song, What Else Can I Do? Here is Mike Phillips. It 
doesn't really seem to work that way Tell me everything will be okay How long is it gonna take With all the progress that I thought I'd made My excitement is gone and my passion fades How much longer must I live in pain It's a heavy price to pay for today's edition of The Journal, but be sure to tune in next Wednesday for more awesome documentaries and live entertainment. I would miss that if I were you. Showing us out is Mike Phillips once more, ladies and gentlemen. For The Journal, I've been Farine Kareem. And I'm still Shan Prabhu Singh. Have, Have a great, great day, everyone.